I would like to introduce my final icon of the evening. Um, another one who's multifaceted. Uh, you may have seen him in some movies, some of Israel Luna's work, and um, he's done some radio and some TV, and um, he has been a staple in our community for a long, long time. Back many, many years ago, 12 years ago this summer, Robert Emery, where are you? We did an all-male production of Steel Magnolias at the um, Greer Garson Theater at SMU. How many of you did, did get to see that? Did any of you? Yeah. Yeah, well, this lovely creature was a Nell. And couldn't have been more perfectly cast because the character that she's come to be known so famously for and so fondly for really is just another incarnation of Nell. So at this time, please welcome to the stage the one, the only, Edna Jean Robinson. <laughs> Hello, y'all. No, so nice to see you. I want to start by saying, the whole time I was putting this together, I felt kind of like it was an obituary. I, I felt like I was writing my memorial. And so I decided to wear white. <laughs> because it's not my memorial. It's not my death. It's not my obituary. It's my wedding. It's my future wedding. I can fucking get married in 37 states! And I think the Supreme Court is going to make sure that I can get married in fucking Texas. Where that horrible Rick Perry, I hope, grits his teeth so hard that they break on the penis that he is sucking. <laughs> I promise that I will not use vulgarity all night long. I'm just really mad about Rick Perry and not being able to one day be Mrs. Jack D. Bliss. But tonight, 27 years, I went back and I started writing. And you can't get 27 years and 12 minutes in a song. You just can't do it. So I hope a lot of you know all the new work I hope a lot of you have seen some of the movies that I'm in. I hope that some of you saw me in Bent this year because I was fabulous in it. Did you miss it? <laughs> well, of course you did. <laughs> Lesbians always miss the... <laughs> they always miss Bent. And so I hope that you're seeing my videos. They're called Shopping and Boobs for Christmas. And I've got five new coming up this year. And I want you to visit my website, which is EdnaJeanRobinson.com. It's getting a whole new revamp. I just did an audition in New York, and I was this close to getting it, which means I didn't. Again. But... I'm going to go back, and I will go back every goddamn time RuPaul sends out an audition. I'm going to put in a tape. So eventually, I, it's my goal to, for you to see me on television again, sometime, somewhere, somehow, including if it's my memorial. <laughs> so we're going to start with everybody say hey. Hey. Everybody say ho. Ho. Oh. Please, everybody say hey ho to Donna Day. Donna Day taught me so much. And so we're going to kind of start and end with Donna Day. I became the show director in 1997. And Donna Day taught me so much. And the first thing that she taught me was to use what you got. Because nobody else has it. And so exploit it. Because you can sell it if it belongs to you. That's the truth, right? See, look at him. He could be Clark Kent. <laughs> okay. So I graduated from Auburn University in 1988, and what I did was get the hell out of Auburn, Alabama, and I moved directly to the big city of Dallas, Texas. 
And I was so glad to be here because it was my goal to go to either Los Angeles or New York because I was going to be a famous star. And I was going to be either be on Broadway or I was going to make movies or I was going to sing and I was going to, I was going to win a Grammy, a Tony. I was going to win an Oscar, God damn it. And I was going to do a duet with Barbara Streisand sometime in my life. But I ended up in Dallas and what I did was I fell in love almost the minute I got here with a man named Jack D. Bliss. And I became a member of the Dallas Alliance Theater. Does anybody remember that? Yes, that's going way back. I loved the Dallas Alliance Theater. I learned a lot there. I learned a lot there that I hadn't learned in college. Um, I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Auburn, and I was very, very proud of my degree. And when I got here at Dallas Alliance Theater, I realized I had a lot to learn. And because I was a baritone and I was a pretty good singer, I said, I'm going to join this little group called the Turtle Creek Corral. And so I did. And I joined immediately. And the very first night of rehearsal, I ran into this little portly blonde, bleach blonde boy from Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. And he had a soprano, nelliest, nelliest voice I've ever seen. But he was wearing Daisy Dukes and Gams for 462 days. And he said, hi, my name is Pitiful Bitch. Call me PB. Everybody does. And I went, oh, my God, my sister, I love you. How many of you remember Pitiful Bitch? I'll give you little tidbits. Me and Pitiful Bitch were the first drag queens on Dallas cable television. Proud of that. So at the Turtle Creek Corral, there's a yearly fundraiser, and it's called Miss Big Thicket. And in 1991, it was the first year that Miss Big Thicket was going to be a pageant. And me and Pitiful decided that we are going to be contestants. Elizabeth Bliss is born. Oh, no, don't, no, do not wow that. <laughs> that is not pretty. That is definitely a boy in makeup. And I thought I was having some good old-fashioned fish sticks, girl. Look at that. I thought I was so hot. You couldn't, you, no, you would not believe that that was a man walking down the street. And so I decided with Pitiful Bitch to enter Miss Big Thicket. Roll that beautiful bum footage. Question number five and question and answer. Nelda Pickens was always Betty the MC. Wearing my own hair. The gimmick from this big thicket is you have to perform live. So I have to go back for just one more minute. In 1987, I entered a pageant as Heather Harden. And Heather Harden was sort of bribed to do this pageant. And I believe in the end, I believe if I remember it correctly, it was Miss Gay Georgia America. And I was bribed because I was told that not only my entry fee would be paid, but I would also be given a hit of X. <laughs> so it was 1987, and I'm going to take that hit of X. So it yeah, done, man. What? Yes. So I want to tell you that I did presentation, evening gown, and talent in the same dress. <laughs> and in the middle of talent, which was hot lunch, and as you recall, hot lunch has about 25 seconds of vocal and five and a half minutes of instrumental. So I did the entire talent running around doing cartwheels back flipping because in the middle of it, my ex kicked in. 
<laughs> I also changed my name that night because every time that I was brought on for a category, it was, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage and telling category, Heather Hardon. So I changed my name to Anna Abortion. <laughs> now I'm Elizabeth Bliss, and she came in last place out of six. True story. The Turtle Creek Corral was like, thanks, yeah. Oh, no. Every year, the Turtle Creek Corral takes a retreat, and it's a, it's a retreat weekend. It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. On Saturday night, they have a great big show. What do 200 gay men creative that sing do? They put on shows. And the show was incredible. The concert series was called At The Hop. We were broken up into motorcycle gangs. We were broken, broken up into the nerds and the jocks. I wanted to be a cheerleader, but it wasn't a category or a group. So I was a nerd. And we were encouraged to come to the show as our character in the show, which was a nerd. So I went down to Ardmore, Oklahoma. I went to the, I went downtown Ardmore and I found Edna Jean at the Salvation Army. <laughs> Let's take a look. This picture is from the night that Edna Jean first was born. Notice the purse. Gotta have a purse. And the purse has been very important to me, and it's been very important over the last 25 or 20 years, and I'll explain in a minute. So at this retreat, Edna Jean is born. I found out that I work at the Miller's Dairy Freeze, and I make the footlong chili dogs. I live on Highway 67. I aspire to have a double wide, but right now I have a single wide. And I did go to Ardmore High. And I teach Sunday school at the Lighthouse Assembly of God Church. And I am coming to the retreat show as a guest of Pitiful Bitch, who is, of course, one of the jock's girlfriend, and she's a slut. And I'm her cousin. Edna was a great big hit that night. And I did have a ball. I had, a, I had the biggest ball that I've had since I'd been here. My husband went with us, Pitiful and I. Oh, it was a great weekend. And so, Miss Big Thicket is next. I got recruited to be a contestant in the 1992-93 Miss Big Thicket. Please roll that beautiful Number bean six, footage. Contestant Number six. My name is Edna Jean Robinson. I'm a Sunday school teacher at, at the Lighthouse Assembly of God in Ardmore, Oklahoma. The animal, the bird, and all the creeping things. I told the story well, of the great flood of Noah and the great Maine. flood. I will now send rain on the land and destroy <laughs> every living thing that I have made. And Noah entered the ark with his wife and his sons and his sons' wives and the animals two by two. Donor's cost for this asset was $20,000 and its fair value at the date of the gift was $30,000. What was the amount of depreciation of this asset and what amount should, be, should the organization recognize at, in its 1992 financial statement? 2000 Your new Miss Big Ticket 1993 Contestant number six, Edna Jean Robinson! All right, give her a hand! Yes, Edna Jean Robinson, the new Miss Big Ticket 1993. And that's my official Miss Big Ticket portrait. <laughs> they were calling me a charity girl. I didn't know what, exactly what that meant. What does that mean, charity girl? And then I was told charity girls raise money and the, the professionals don't. And I said, well, those fucking bitches should get out the hell out of the rose room and go raise some money. And if I have anything to do with that, I'll have that changed. That was my goal. And so 
a charity girl. I took it very seriously and I decided that it was going to be my goal to make more money, raise more money than anyone has raised before because people were dying everywhere. It was such a horrible time. Terrible time, especially for the Turtle Creek Corral. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful young men were dying everywhere. And we were watching it and our government was was denying that it was happening and we were seeing it happen if a chair went vacant for two weeks he was dead and we were sure of it young beautiful boys were dropping like flies and I don't I don't want this to be sad because it's not and I'll explain why later so the Turtle Creek Corral was instrumental in making me who I am and I am always I'm going to be forever indebted to the Turtle Creek Corral and the men of it because we started an organization that was called the TCC Angels. And the TCC Angels were a group of volunteer men, and I was one of them, who said, call on me if you need me. Call on me if you need me to go knock down a door. Call on me if you need to get a ride to the hospital. Call on me if you can't get up. Call on me if you need anything. And call on me, they did. And call on countless others that said, I'm here to help. Because, you know, at that point, I just assumed I was going to die. I just assumed that I was going to get HIV. It lived in my home. Jack Bliss was HIV positive, so I just imagined at some point it was going to get me as well. This is 1992-93, and it was just a war zone. And there was nobody to count on except us. And that's exactly what we did, and that's exactly how we did it. We jumped in, we took care of it, and we made sure that these boys did not die alone. When I was at TCC Angel, there was a man that um, I went to go see every Friday, sometimes more, sometimes it was every Friday, sometimes every Tuesday and Friday. And he had been taken in by Phil Barnett and Harry Coddington, and they opened up their home to him. Um, those of you that lived through it know that taking care of someone in the late stages of HIV and AIDS is, was extremely difficult. And so I would go and I would sit with him. He loved macaroni and cheese, and so I would sometimes make macaroni and cheese and we would sit and eat it. He was less than a hundred pounds and I'll tell you he was mean and he was bitter and I think he had some right to be and I kind of made sure that if he was gonna be bitter be bitter with me girl it's so it's all good we'll turn it into a joke and so we talked very candidly about life and we talked very candidly about death and he said to me one day you know I would really love to see Edna Jean again and so the next time I went to go see him, I went to go see him as Edna Jean. And I stayed in character the entire time. And he lit up like I've never seen him light up. And he responded to it. And it was, it was, it was so moving for me that I said, oh, I have the power. And I was so grateful I was so grateful that I could allow him three minutes or 30 minutes to not feel no dignity, to not feel so much pain and, and, and shut in. He was in this little room and he wanted to be in this dark area and he just, he really just wanted to curl up and die because that's what was next. And so he did, he died. And instead of going to Miguel every Friday, I went to Parkland, or I went to Presbyterian. And my husband was on the DGA, and John Thomas and my husband would get things from off the street, and all the, men, all the, all the merchants would give them things, and then I would put them in my purse. 
and I would walk around at the AIDS wards of Parkland and Presbyterian and Southwestern, I don't remember what it was called. I would find out where, where the boys were and I would go see them and I would give them things from my purse. And boys had been there for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, hadn't been touched at all. People had treated them like lepers and food was left in hallways and had not even been delivered and people were afraid of them and I marched right in there with my purse and I would give them a keychain from Bud Light. <laughs> what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> However, I do kind of remember there was like a protest against Miller Light, so I had all kinds of Bud products in my purse. And so I would walk around and I would I would just talk to these boys, and I'm going to tell you, it's the most important work that I've ever done, and it shaped me to what I did for the next decade and a half, and what I'm going to do for the next, hopefully, 20, who knows how long I'm going to live, but you can always count on me to fundraise, and you can always count on me to raise money. I am extremely grateful to all the boys who taught me. They taught us how to love, and they taught us how to be empathetic, and they taught us how important it is for us to love one another and to care for one another. In 1996, I became Miss Miss America, and I also became Miss Charity America. I want to introduce you to my best friend, Tim Arwood. He was the most beautiful boy in the world. We grew up together in Opelika, Alabama. That's him with my husband, Jack Bliss. And he died when I was Miss Charity America in 1996. He, um, he was breathtaking. God, he was so beautiful. He was Bugle Boy of 1988. He was really on the way to being so damn famous because he was so gorgeous. Six foot three, hairy chested, beautiful blonde with beautiful teeth and I was so jealous. <laughs> I really wasn't because I loved him. And we made the perfect little team because he was so gorgeous and well, I was so not. <laughs> How many of you remember my husband Jack Bliss? I'm glad. He's been dead for five years and I miss him terribly all the time. In the Turtle Creek Corral, I made two extremely important relationships. And the first one, of course, you already know is Pitiful Bitch. We did so much stuff together. In fact, I did stuff that I look back and go, wow, I really did pull five hot dogs out of my asshole. <laughs> and then I put them in hot dog buns, put mustard on them, and asked you if you wanted to eat them. And I'm going to tell you that if you're going to do that, make sure that the hot dogs are frozen. <laughs> because the first time I did it, they weren't. And they didn't make it into the bun very well. But the second time, I was working at John L's, and I could go, boom, boom, boom. And they would roll on the floor underneath that little brass rail, and I would chase it, and I would put it in the hot dog bun, and y'all would eat it. That's the really confusing thing there, is y'all would eat it. And so I have done all kinds of things in my career to get money. I have begged, I have borrowed, I, I haven't quite stolen, but I probably will. Can I see your purse? <laughs> Pardon me? Lesbians don't carry purses. Can I have your wallet? <laughs> And so I have done all sorts of things. Last year, I allowed you to throw rotten tomatoes at you, at me, for ten dollars a pop, and I raised that money for the for the Sam Houston School, and that was 
really a lot of fun. I hate tomatoes. The other relationship that I made was with Todd Savell. Todd Savell was brilliant at being an editor. He did some beautiful editing work for the Turtle Creek Corral. He did some beautiful film work. We started making a lot of films. In fact, we won several, we won several awards before 1995 at the Agleve Austin Gay and Lesbian International Film Festival. We won audience favorite twice, two years in a row with Jean-Appel Edna Jean, and then we went again with Avantois. Me and Pitiful felt like we were stars because they called and wanted to book us in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> That's a resort town to some people. <laughs> we were on our way. In fact, we got $25 a piece to come all, all the way over to ride outside of Shreveport they put some plywood on top of that on top of that pool table and then built a stairwell out of the Miller Lite boxes. We were on our way. We did a lot of really, really fine video. We made parodies. We made all kinds of, you know, just really great videos. And this is one that's Coming my soon. favorite. And they wouldn't treat me this way if I weren't in this chair. Pitiful bitch. Because of your accident, pitiful, you you are you are in that seated position. You are. Edna Jean Robinson. Rise and shine, rise and shine. <laughs> I've got your din din. <laughs> Todd Savell was so, was so funny. He was really such a funny man. His parents buried a 17-year-old boy that was their high school honor student in high school. The jock, the drama, they totally despised the fact that he turned into a gay man filmmaker. And it was really, really, really awful. It was really horrible to go see that funeral because his parents really hated him for what he became and what he was that they totally ignored that he lived another 23 years. And when I went there and I saw that and I met the parents and I mean I had talked to them on the phone before and I talked to the father regularly and I talked to the mother on several occasions. I'd never met them. And when they finally met me, they, they, they were really grief stricken, but they were grief stricken for their 17 year old boy. And it was that day that I realized one day parents are going to be proud of their gay children. One day, a mother is going to cry tears of joy rather than sadness that she got one. And she is going to not question what she did wrong, but she is going to thank whoever it is that she thanks that she is the lucky woman. And that has also been part of my platform. I was really lucky because there's Jack. said I would cry. I love Jack Bliss and he was so he was so supportive of all the crazy shit that I wanted to do and that I've ever done and if I said to him what do you think about that and he would say oh I think that's going too far. <laughs> I knew I was onto something and I needed to go just a little bit further. <laughs> like pulling hot dogs out of my asshole. Because if you could guess them, you got a prize. How many do you think I have in my asshole right now, Clark? <laughs> he said, 24, you're a cunt. 
<laughs> and so when I hear things like people say the golden era of drag, or back in the day, or I wish that the change wasn't happening to our community. I want you to be reminded of the young men that died for us in Parkland. And remember, today is somebody's golden day. And I don't want to, I really don't want to go back into the future. It's a great place to visit, but I don't want to stay there. I want to move forward into the future because the future has in store for us wonderful and beautiful things like how about equality? How about children being adopted that need parents? And how about just that I can be Mrs. Jack T. Bliss? And so I want to move. I want to go forward. I want to continue to live. And I want you to continue to do what you do proudly. I want you to hold hands of your, of, to your boyfriend as you walk down the street. And I want you to kiss your girlfriend so lovingly when you're at the grocery store. My friends Tina and, and Melissa do that right now. And it always just makes me so happy to see it. Because I don't want you people to know that I have a heart. But I really do. And I'd cry, and when I had my little, I had my little time of um, question and answer with Tammy Nash with the Dallas Voice, when I hung up, I cried for like 30 minutes, and I thought, what am I crying for? It's a new day. It's a brand new time. Drag is not just, drag is just not for gays anymore. Drag is on TV, baby! And the, the, demographic, the demographic for the RuPaul's Drag Race is 35-year-old white women that live in Iowa. I want to be a part of that world today. I'm glad that I was a part of that world. And I'm glad, I'm glad that Jack and George paved the way to demonstrate to all of us that it's important that our love should not be behind a wall. And AIDS taught us that. And the young men that died said to all of us that we have to be compassionate and we must be empathetic and we have to hold each other's hands and we have to be supportive and we have to be a family because that's exactly what we are. In this community in Dallas, that's what we've always been. And I am so proud that you've allowed me to be a part of it, that you have celebrated me in all of my crazy antics and all of the crazy things that I do. I've done it because I want nothing but a better life for all of us. And this video started it all. can turn the world on with her smile produced by Todd Savelle and Gary Cox who can take a nothing day and suddenly make it all seem worthwhile well it's you girl and you should know it with each glance and every little movement you show it love is all alone, no need to 